How do you use a UAD Universal Audio console and its plugins to process audio for audiobooks? That's what we're tackling today. Hello, I'm Jay. Welcome to my booth. This is by request. If you have other requests like this, let me know. I'll tackle them ASAP. And if you like the stuff and you find it helpful, helps other folks find us if you're willing to click the buttons down below. Let's dive in. So I've got my UAD console pulled open here. And before we talk about all the specifics of what I'm going to go through, a couple important points that I think are good to address up front. Firstly, a lot of this processing will depend on the publisher that I'm working with and the production pipeline in question. First, let's talk about the publishers. Different publishers have different sounds in mind and sort of different standards for their audiobook sound, generally speaking. Uh, and that means that some will request specific types of microphones. Now, does that mean that you need a U87AI, for example? Of course not. You can get by with just about any professional grade, that is the terminology that they use pretty much across the board, professional grade XLR microphone. If you have questions about what might be a good choice, hit me up down below and I'd be happy to respond. Um, so with that said, big names like uh, Penguin Random House, uh, Macmillan, Tantor, uh, others, sometimes Audible, they'll ask you to use a professional grade large diaphragm condenser microphone. Others, uh, specifically my producer at Audible, who I worked with for a time, loved the Shure SM7B. So it really depends on who you're working with and the type of sound that they want, generally speaking. So that's the publishers. Next, the production pipeline. The amount of processing as well as the type of microphone that I personally will elect to use depends on if I've got an audio engineer who's helping me out on the back end. If you're working with a major publisher or really any publisher, they're, they're going to ask you for the raw audio unprocessed because they have their own sound again and they know what they want to do. And honestly, an audio engineer is probably going to do a better job than we will because they're pros at that thing. Um, so if I have an engineer, I'll use something like a U87 AI because the amount of detail that it captures will only improve my performance on in a broad sense. However, if I'm doing the processing for myself, uh, I will elect for not something that's as sensitive as the U87 AI more often than not. And the reason being is simply quality of life and speed for me. If I have to do the editing on the back end myself, um, a more forgiving microphone than the U87 AI, something like the Shure SM7B or the Earthworks Ethos, uh, is my weapon of choice, simply because it'll save me time in the long run. So, with that little discussion out of the way, let's talk about the UAD console. All of these numbers are tuned specifically to my voice, my space, this microphone, my relationship vocally and sonically to this microphone in this space. It's very specific to me, is what I'm trying to say. So do not just copy paste these settings onto your own audio because it's not gonna sound the way that you should sound. Uh, but I'm gonna show you how I manipulate each of these so that you can dial them in for yourself. Um, so first up, let me just turn all these off so you can hear what I sound like without any processing. So the difference is, uh, there is a difference, but it is a little subtle, you could say. The first plugin that I like to use is the C-Suite Cvox. And to be perfectly honest, I never used this before, and I'm frankly pretty wary of most noise reduction plugins and softwares, simply because my philosophy is A, less is more, across the board, the less processing that I do, the better it's going to sound at the end of the day. And uh, particularly with live processing, noise reduction like this, if you get too heavy handed, it's going to sound funky. So that's honestly how I kind of find the optimal processing for this thing. Uh, so I just turned it on and you may be able to hear a subtle difference if you're listening closely. But the big thing will be in the room tone. So I'll turn it off again. 
And I'm going to stop talking for a second so you can get a sense of my room tone. And now we'll turn it back on and see what we get. So it's really, really subtle, not doing a lot, and that's exactly what we want. Across the board with noise reduction software, if you hear it doing its job, you're putting too much muscle into it. Uh, so the way I find the sweet spot for me is always less is more, but I'll turn this attenuation up and try to find a spot where it's not pumping a lot. And I've found it's really difficult to hear live. It's easier in playback. Um, but if I put it here where it's really, really low attenuation, this is essentially turning down the room tone, uh, an expander somewhat that's specifically tuned. Um, that's a good number for me. This ambience, it's letting in room tone and sort of the reverb of my space. If you turn it all the way down, none of it's going to come in. It's going to process more. If you turn it there, it's not going to do hardly anything. Uh, so a low sweet spot somewhere in there is good. And that's kind of where I've landed for the time being. Uh, next up is the Precision Channel Strip. Uh, UAD, the Universal Audio System, it comes with a lot of different EQ equalizers. This is one that's included, and I find it easy to use, and it's pretty transparent. What I mean by transparent is it doesn't change the tone of my voice. It doesn't add any sort of warmth. It doesn't add any sort of saturation, no distortion. It's very transparent uh, for the most part which is what I personally prefer. Um, so I've got a high pass filter here on the low section, starting at 75 hertz, basically. The UAD console always has a high pass filter built into it. I just double down for kicks. These next frequency bands are simply hunting out and taming ever so slightly resonances here in my booth. What I mean by resonances is wavelengths of sound, specific frequencies of sound that build up here in my space. They sound kind of boomy. So if I turn these guys off, the difference in my sound is really subtle. But uh, the way I hunt out these resonant frequencies, I'll turn on a band. And the way I go about it is I will turn this all the way up so that I'm finding, uh, this is the Q selector. A higher number is a sharper point. A lower number is a wider band or like a plateau or shelf almost. Uh, so a high number like this is a sharp point. A low number like this is a wide band. Um, so to hunt out resonant frequencies, I'll crank this sucker up pretty high. And then what I'll do is I'll crank the volume up here. Uh, I'll make it boost that frequency really heavily. And then I'll just play and start speaking and sweep for frequencies that sound boomy. I'll turn this on now and we'll hunt it out together. Uh, here we go. So again, I'll turn this all the way up and I'll just start dragging this frequency around and you can hear specific frequencies get boosted really specifically. But then when I get to a specific boomy frequency like this one, it doesn't sound, I mean, none of them sound good, but this one particularly sounds eh. So in order to tame that, I'm going to turn this down first so we can stop listening to that. Uh, in terms of how much to turn it down, between minus one to minus three, never beyond minus three in my own personal opinion, less is more. And then what I'll do is I'll drop the Q so that it's a wider band because if it's aggressive, you'll get an aggressive uh, sort of frequency notch and a wider one, it will you'll hear it less in my personal experience of fiddling about. Um, so anywhere in here is fine. And then I'll do that for other frequencies as need be. So again, turn this guy on, crank this up. I'll turn up the Q so it's pretty high. Whoops, a diddle. Turn this Q up so it's really high and specific on a very specific frequency. And then I'll just sweep trying to find specific boomy frequencies 
and I had already tuned it in to a uh, specific one right about here. Again, drop the cue a little bit, drop the attenuation, and cleaning it up. So a bit of a before and after. Here we are with that on, and here we are with that off. Really subtle, not going to do a ton, uh, but it saves a little bit of work on the tail end. And then the last one here, both my voice and Neumann microphones like this one in particular have a mid-forward sound, uh, which is great if you're talking over like a music bed or something like that. For something like an audiobook, it can get somewhat honky. So if I pump this up, you can start to hear how uh, those frequencies of my voice are grating a bit. Um, and so I just attenuate that a bit. That's a personal choice for this specific microphone brand. Uh, but there you go. That's how I hunt those out. And then the last thing I'll do, because I'm turning down the volume on certain lower frequencies of my recordings, I just boost it a little bit overall here on the master EQ um, dial, volume dial. On this plugin, I'm not using the compressor at all because I prefer this one, the LA-2A Tektronics. Um, there are many compressors that are free with the UAD system once you buy the UAD system. Um, and this one is just my uh, weapon of choice. I've said that a few times, but it's true. Uh, and the reason why is it's really simple. There's two knobs. You can't really mess it up. Additionally, it adds a subtle amount of saturation, which I just find pleasing. It's not overwhelming in terms of the way it changes the tone. It just warms everything up ever so slightly. So we'll turn it on and talk a bit more about it. And here we are with it on. So it's really, really subtle in terms of the amount of saturation, but uh, it just adds a bit of warmth. So I'll turn it off again, and you can hear that it's... Uh, just a, a very subtle little warmth that it adds when I turn it on. Now, in terms of dialing this in, I've talked a bit about how I use this, but for audiobooks specifically, in my regular speech, if I'm not projecting in any weird way, it's just like sort of my level stasis baseline levels, uh, I will move this peak reduction dial until I start to see this little needle here in the center bouncing pretty regularly between the zero and the minus one. And I, that means that I'm not over compressing. I'm just taming the peaks of my audio ever, ever so slightly. If I over compress, uh, I have to boost it and it sounds really, really boomy and my noise floor is out of control. So this is over compressed dramatically. And then if I uh, don't compress at all, then it's not really doing anything in the first place. Uh, so I'll turn this peak knob until I start seeing this needle bouncing a bit between there. And the reason I like to use this for audiobooks is if I have a character where say they're talking to someone across from the across the room, hey, uh, would you mind passing the thing to me from over there? I don't have to worry about riding the gain knob necessarily on my interface. I can just trust that my compressor is gonna help keep everything within a manageable level. And then as far as dialing in the gain, before I uh, turn any of my processing on, so we'll switch all these off real quick, I look at the levels that I'm hitting average on my console here. And it looks like I'm bouncing mostly between minus 12, minus 9, sometimes up to minus 6. And so when I turn everything on, I want it to be about the same. So I'll turn this gain knob until it's hitting about minus 9, with peaks sometimes going up to minus six if need be. So that's how I use the UAD console for recording in general, but specifically with audiobooks. Uh, and then once it's all in my recording software, depending on the software I'm using, I've got a couple preset um, signal chains that I use just to clean everything up ever so slightly if I'm processing the audio myself. If I'm not, again, I'll ship it off to the engineer and they'll take care of it. For me, uh, I use the Isotope Mouth D Clicker, and then I'll also use just a very, very subtle gate, and that's it. The gate is there just only to get where the moments where I punch in and out of my audio. If I make a mistake, there might be a keyboard click that uh, I'm catching the tail end of when I punch in here and there. This is here 
purely to catch those and that's it. So it's a very, very gentle. Um, and the reason I like this specific plugin is this is uh, a really flexible gate that behaves sort of like a gate slash expander and it makes uh, the editing really, really easy on the tail end. And then the very last thing I'll do before I'm shipping off the audio and it's all been QC'd and all that jazz, I'll do a loudness pass. Here in Adobe Audition, there's this nifty little loudness meter. Drag the audio over. I'll plug in these uh, settings, run it, and it limits and pumps the audio as it needs to be pumped. If I'm using my uh, DAW of choice for audiobooks, which is Reaper, simply because it makes uh, categorizing audio and mastering the audio much easier for me, um, here's an audiobook that I was just working on. In the rendering window, uh, I have another video talking about how to set up presets for this, but this normalize limit fade, it makes it so simple to export the audio per distribution specifications so that it can be posted on Audible, Spotify, anywhere that audiobooks go. You just plug these uh, settings in and you're ready to rock pretty much no matter what. Uh, the only thing that I've found is occasionally title cards because they're so short, um, you may need to double check those. But with that on in Reaper, it's really, really simple. So I hope this was helpful for you. If you have any questions about this, anything else voiceover related, drop me a line down below and I'll help you out ASAP. Until the next one, be well. Toodles. Toodles.